Hi guys, welcome to episode 18 of our intermediate series. Today we're going to be looking at the Plappan Python or the Plappan Olive Python, Apodora Papuana. First described by Peters and Diora in 1878 as Liasis Papuanus. Subsequent changes, and there were a few, were Liasis Papuanus by Boulanger in 1893, Liasis Tornieri by Werner in 1897, Liasis Tornieri by De Rouge in uh, 1917, Liasis Maximus, which is ace, they should have kept that, Liasis Maximus, it's a badass Latin name, and that was by Werner in 1936. Then Liasis Olivaceus Papuanus by Stimson in 1969. And then the biggest one of note up to press was Apodora Papuana. Hi. You grumpy hissy bum, aren't you? Apodora Papuana by Cluj in 1993. Arnold G. Cluj is a professor emeritus of zoology and curator emeritus of amphibians and reptiles at the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology. He's a regular contributor to scientific journals and over his career has had 140 articles published in various scientific journals. In one of those journal issues, this will have been named as Apodora Papuana. He has been honoured three times in science with three different geckos named after him, Certidactylus clugei, Diplodactylus clugei and Ligodactylus clugei. Did that stop the taxonomic flip-flopping that we've all got used to in these videos that I do? Did it buggery? It just kept going. So, further changes were Morelia Papuanus. So that placed it with carpet pythons by Welsh in 1994. Then back to Apodora in the further three papers. And then back to Liasis Papuana by Reynolds in 2014. And then finally reconfirmed as Apodora Papuana by Wallach and Barker in 2014 and 2015 respectively. When Cluj first used Apodora, it was to try and describe the skin of the species. And in the big adults that they were capturing on the island, there was uh, a lot of loose skin, a lot of uh, scar tissue, which they were quite famous for. And Apodora comes from the Greek for a peeling of the skin. The Papan python skin is extremely delicate and is prone to scarification and full on tears. And there's been a suggestion that this could be autonomous, so it could be a defense mechanism. Uh, and we can see because this is an important one, we've got some lighter colored shades, maybe some blemishes, but I picked this one because it was particularly clean, but there were some that came on the shipment that were literally riddled in scars. Um, and it turns out that whilst we found that, you know, unappetizing to the eye, in actual fact, perfectly normal um, and it seems to be a, a factor of the species so um, interestingly in the interstitial skin so there's skin in between the scales the inside of the mouth and the cloaca is all black and as a further defense mechanism as well as the skin tearing to escape predation they also as babies will open their mouth wide and flatten well this one you probably saw when it first came out flattened its head so they'll flatten their head and if pushed further they'll gape and show that black inside of their mouth um, but you seem to have relaxed a little bit now we're not getting the huffing and puffing anymore are we are we friends now good man so yeah the black of the mouth is a defense mechanism type locality for the species is sarong which is on the western coast of the birdhead peninsula which is at extreme northwest of irian jaya the natural range extends from Misul, which is an island just off the coast of Sarong, right through Irian Jaya and Papua New Guinea, down to Ferguson Island off the eastern coast. So um, the weather data, I couldn't find exactly for Sarong, which was the locality type, but I found it for Manatwari, which is still Birdhead Peninsula, but 300 kilometers away to the east. And what it showed was that it's incredibly linear. Uh, October, November and December were marginally warmer with a daytime high of 32 degrees Celsius. The other nine months registered 31 degrees Celsius. So there's a whole degree in it. And then day, uh, nighttime lows, 24 degrees all year round, all 12 months, 24 degrees at night. 
So when we're looking for triggers or things that we could use for breeding or cycling of, the, of these species where we're from linear places, we may have to look elsewhere. So the next logical step was to look at rainfall. And a dry season, if we can describe it as that, would be from August to November with 79 to 120 millimetres of rain per month. The wet season being from January to April with 154 to 190 millimetres of rain per month. You've you, you become nice and friendly. I think you've fired up a bit. We'll get to that in a minute, the firing up. So there isn't really a dry season as such. It's still pretty muggy and pretty rainy. And as a result, we have almost linear humidity as well at between 83 and 85% across the island. So then we're going to look at another variable, which is famed for having got many python species breeding over the years from the locality, and that includes the green tree pythons, and that's barometric pressure. So we'd be waiting for a good tropical storm, a good electrical storm, a really strong low front where we would introduce them and hope that we would get breeding action. But it's not quite as easy as that, which we'll get to slightly later, because this species has somewhat of an issue with cage mates. Northern Hemisphere breeding trials are sporadic and few and far between, chiefly getting animals of an adult size and that are, are of good enough condition, bearing in mind that this is an imported animal and would take years to develop into a breeding weight, breeding condition animal. And they also have a reputation as snake eaters in captivity and they are ophiophagic, so they eat other snakes. Uh, and obviously these are not cheap snakes and people are reticent to put them together because of the combative behavior that the animals show towards one another and that isn't just reserved to the sparring of males this can be between males and females so that poses somewhat of an issue and with how prone the skin is to scarring and tearing obviously unsightly wounds and things can ensue and it's then do we want to risk the animals which is a real shame because the species needs work but <clears throat> what was noted by Ross and Marzek in uh, the reproductive husbandry in pythons and boas is that the successful breeding trials took place with animals far older than we normally would use with animals anywhere from 15 to 30 years in age and they produced viable eggs. So they also note in their book, which is one of the best books on the subject, even though it's old, it is awesome. Reproductive Husbandry of Pythons and Boas, um, that uh, breeding season is between August and September. Uh, November is um, laying and then February is hatching. But it was also mentioned uh, again that the animals are far far older than we would normally think and we need to make sure that we've got the correct amounts of mass and the animals are adequately sated on food so that they're not in uh, the mood to chow down on their sexual partner. Feeding is not an issue for youngsters, they who are purportedly as voracious as the adults and will feed almost immediately, famed for their ability to be able to eat huge meals. Uh, the babies will take adult mice straight off the bat and adult uh, pop and olive pythons have been known to even tackle wallabies, which is quite a sizable meal. No use hissing behind my head. Come here. Is that sniff offing and puffing behind me? I'm talking. You're supposed to be making a good show of yourself. You disappeared. So the babies will grow normally. There's no real issue there. The incubation is 32 to 33 degrees Celsius. They'll hatch between 65 and 70 days. Uh, and, and the babies don't seem particularly problematic to establish on food. Although there have been reports that they are prone to blistering, and this is from people keeping them in saturated enclosures. So it's probably better, as with a lot of the other species of python, that we give them an isolated moss box that they can hide in, which then they can soak. It's, the air is saturated in there, but when they remove themselves from this and come out into the vivarium, it is a dry enclosure. And I would follow that technique through into adulthood as well essentially because we don't want any stuck skin when they go through a shed cycle because if it starts to snag and tug and it tugs too hard there is the risk of tearing again and it's just trying to preserve this awesome look on this snake i just hope the camera's picking up the colors because this guy is popping he fed the other day and he's fired up we've got loads of iridescence we've got two different sets of shades going on so we've got like this dark green versus this light green down sides this lovely sort of charcoal uh, grey face with the black edging around the uh, around the uh, the scales, and also as a note, when we compare it to the olive python we've done a video on, is head shape. Uh, this guy has got a serious noggin, serious sized head, and uh, Paul, who who works with me at the shop, uh, had some very very big animals 
20, 30 years ago and said that the head were huge, like a man's hand, uh, and, and as, as deep as a fist. Really, really robust heads. Um, adults obviously are going to require large enclosures, but they are listed as being terrestrial. So they're not necessarily going to need these huge expenses of height, but they would need plenty of room to move around. Um, being able to put a pin in exactly what the mature adult size is, is difficult. The numbers within captivity aren't particularly brilliant and there's a huge amount of variability. So we'll say anywhere from nine to 14 feet, depending on age, sex and condition. Temperament is mixed. Reports come in that the animals can be psychopathic and super aggressive, whereas others report that they're dog tame and you can do anything with them. This guy I would describe as somewhat huffy, but not particularly aggressive. I don't feel even slightly on edge handling him. Um, and he's been a picture of being well behaved. And even though he's only been here a short while, he's already taken unscented defrost prey with gusto. We have very, very little concern. So this species I have put into the intermediate series. But what we need to bear in mind as well is predominantly the animals that are going to be available for people to buy on the market are going to be imported specimens, such as this male, who's probably a year, 18 months old. So he's going to have internal parasites and maybe some other issues that we'll need dealing with down the line. We don't um, treat them immediately upon coming in because we create an immune system crash, which is no good for the animal whatsoever. So what we're going to do is build him up over the next four to six months, add plenty of weight or a subsequent owner will. And then they would go through the process of panicuring or uh, fenbendazole in the animal and making sure that we strip away um, any of the bad guys inside the animal's gut. The problem is panicure is uh, a bit nondescript and will wipe out the good bacteria and things as well so uh, if you have an animal that's compromised uh, or a fresh import it is definitely against our advice to worm it the minute that you get it give it a good four to six months add a load of weight to it and then do it and you'll be far better off i hope you've enjoyed the video this has been a thoroughly enjoying enjoyable episode for me this is um 26 27 years in the making if not slightly longer now, I keep losing track of how long I've been doing it. But this is uh, my first one. Paul's had loads, but Paul's had loads of everything he's been keeping 40 odd years. This for me is uh, just, just awesome. It's not very often that I get to tick another species off my list. Without blowing my trumpet, I kept a lot of snakes. And um, this is exciting. This is a good day for me. And I can really see what they're talking about when... O'Shea and everybody talks about how um, physically they're different to the other liasis. They feel different. The skin is baggier and looser. The head is far bigger. And, um, you know, the, the, the oil on water iridescence is fabulous. The way that this guy's changed colour already in any of the, the, the week or so that we've had him or a couple of weeks that we've had him is phenomenal. And I've only ever seen uh, naturally occurring colour changes like that in Hog Island boas. Um, but on this guy, it's all the more striking because of the, the unicolour of the animal. Um, definitely do your research. Ongoing work to breed these is definitely needed. They are just absolutely fantastic. And uh, you have been a great ambassador for your species, young man. You've been very well behaved. You're a gorgeous boy, aren't you? Hey, gorgeous boy. Keep watching, guys. We'll be back again soon from me and Paul. Snakes and others. Peace.